Hello, Colonial Hockey fans, and welcome to the pandemic version of the Derek Schooley Show with Mike Pursuta and Tim Benz, your broadcast tandem for RMU Hockey as the Colonials get set to play two games, again, in a pandemic version of what a college hockey schedule is, a Thursday evening and a Friday afternoon against the Happy Long hour. Island University Sharks. Happy Hour Hockey. Hockey. <laughs> Henceforth, now to be known as LIU and the Sharks moving forward. Uh, Derek, first of all, long time no speak. Let's get caught up before we get to uh, Long Island University or LIU. And let's talk well, first about of all, it, it, it's a, He's talking about happy hour hockey. Unfortunately, when we're doing this show anymore, we don't get to see Jeff at the, uh, the All-Star. We don't yes. get to see uh, the All-Star Sports Grill, all the fans out there. We don't get to see. Uh, um, and we play weird times now. But it's just about playing hockey. Well, we make it to see Jeff after the ball game on Friday. Should be done by six o'clock. See if you can get it done in regulation, Benzie and I can still catch you at the happy hour as yeah, long as we order food and socially distance from the rest of the patrons. That's not a bad idea. We can we can figure out that way home through Robinson. We can we can get there. We can get there from here. Miss Jeff. Me too. Well, listen, uh, so last time we talked, you guys were about to play three against Mercyhurst. You played two up there. You played one on the island, and uh, you lost the first in overtime. You lost the second 7-5, and then you had a big comeback in game three. Four goals in the third period. Uh, do you want to assess, Derek, these three games individually, or do you kind of look at them as, as a three-pack against the Lakers? Well, I think they were all their own version of, of – different different hockey games actually the first one was a little bit more normal you know we we got a goal probably halfway through the third period to tie it um, we've been very successful in overtime we couldn't get a change they 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 scored a really nice goal uh, obviously we take home a point they get two points that was on a uh, I believe that was a Tuesday night we come back uh, had a cancellation against uh, RIT um, then we come up, come back and play them again a week early up there, getting to kind of run and gun. We were, we were really good through the first period, two to one, had the lead. Next thing you know, halfway through the second, we're down five to two. Going in the locker room, it's five, five. We had a couple uh, tremendous uh, rallies. Unfortunately, they get a, a late power play goal, empty net goal that was off sides. And uh, next thing you know, we're, we're down, we've only got one of six points against Mercyhurst. And Mercyhurst is a good hockey team. They've got some really good offensive players. We knew that. We knew we had to play better. Uh, we came back uh, home this past Saturday, felt that we had uh, two really good periods. and um, But unfortunately, we found ourselves down 3-1 with 18 minutes to go. And uh, that's when the magic started. And just when you think we're down and out, uh, this team doesn't quit. This team's got... Uh, uh, an intensity about them and uh, we got a little energy and one became two and next thing you know uh, we're taking home a 5-3 win and um, but I thought we were pretty good that whole game it's just we got a couple bad bounces and we lost Noah West uh, after one period he got hit in the eye with a stick Dylan Lubismeyer came in and played uh, very well in uh, relief and um, allowed us to to come back and now we're, we're preparing for the Sharks. We ended up taking uh, four of, of nine points, but uh, when you only get one of the first six, uh, the alternative, it, it doesn't come down to a must win, but a, a very important win, and our guys responded. Derek, a couple of things uh, struck me while we were doing the broadcast on uh, Saturday. In your interview after the first period, you said, they're over there hooting and hollering again. They're chirping. And then after the game was over, you mentioned a couple of times we really needed to win that game. I got a feeling those two developments were not unrelated. Mercyhurst chirping and then the Colonials' desire to win the game. Uh, did I did I add one to one and correctly come up with two there? Well, I mean, I think it had a little bit of a, a playoff atmosphere, and uh, they've got some flamboyant offensive players that they were going, and when they get going, they get uh, they get talking to the bench, and uh, that's. It is, it is what it is, and that's what gets their team going. And um, we used to have we used to have a few of those too way back when, and we might have a, a few of them uh, still. But uh, it irritates you a little bit, and and uh, but it was important for us to get that win. You couldn't go down three straight to them. 
especially when we're battling for, uh, um, you know, top spot in, in, in the league. And um, I think that was very important for us. And we're, we're excited to get that win, especially being down three, one. And once again, could have been left for dead, very similar to the Niagara weekend, but uh, found a way to, to not just get one point, but get two points. Zach Lynch and Greg Gibson already count as way back when Derek. <laughs> Uh, you, oh, how'd you read my mind so quickly? <laughs> Is Matt Cope the third star in that group or did I miss one? There were a lot on that team, that's for sure. <laughs> hey, Derek, I, I was reminded when you were speaking there, I, I forgot to do this, but I want to look this up. So Randy Hernandez has seven goals so far. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe so. How many of them have come in the third period? It's got to be five or six or, or overtime. It's got to be five or six, right? Yeah, I don't think he's got one in overtime yet. But he made a couple. He made a nice play to McCallion on his goal. Um, he, I think he's got a couple game-winning goals, and um, you know he found, finds a way and he uses his speed. And um, obviously, Randy's been a big part of our success this year, especially for a freshman. But um, you know, I think the the catalysts really were kind of behind that of of just a bounce back, and we got goals from uh, unlikely sources in that game. And, and uh, obviously Randy got his, and but you get a, a game winning goal from Roman Kramer. You get a, a goal to come back uh, when you're down three, two from or down three, one from Nolan Schaefer. And uh, you know, then you get the, the first one and the third one from Jenny and Hernandez respectfully, but, and then Aiden Spellacy pounds home an empty net or sometimes we have problems hitting that empty net. It was good to get that, uh, you know, 50 seconds left. All of a sudden it goes from, 18 minutes earlier, down 3-1 to up 5-3. And that, that was, like you said, we needed that. Has Randy gotten the message, it appears maybe that he has, of you know using his best attribute, which is his speed? I know you were talking early in the season, rely on your legs to beat the defender, don't rely on your hands. Has he gotten that message more and more as the season has gone along? Yeah, I think so. I think everybody learns how to play at the, every level you go up. you got to learn how to play and what makes you successful. And very rarely are you going to beat defensemen in college hockey one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Can you beat them wide? Absolutely. Uh, but to, to toe drag them and put the puck between their feet and do all that stuff, that, that doesn't happen much anymore. But uh, beating guys wide, taking pucks to the net, and catching them flat-footed, those, those things happen very frequently. So you've got to take the situation and, um, and very, and if you if you try to go wide and you're not able to go wide, you still have the ability to put the puck below the goal line. And those are things that we want to do to be successful as a hockey team. Are, are we correct to assume that uh, West doesn't have any lingering vision problems and uh, there'll be no uh, effect going into these uh, next couple of games? Well, we'll see. Um, we're still here early in the week, and um, we've got to, we've just got to play it day by day. I mean, he looked like Rocky after the game. Uh, he wanted needed Mick to cut him uh, just so he could see out of his eye. So we'll see how it is. He, he wears contacts, so that 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 could be a, a little bit of an issue. And unless he becomes Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and starts wearing rec specs, um, that might be a, an issue as the whole week goes on. So we'll see. We'll play it by ear. And and uh, but Dylan has been Dylan's been been good when called upon, and uh, that's the that's the benefit of having uh, outstanding goaltending. If you were to make both the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar Rex Specs reference and the Rocky reference to Noah, would he get either of them, or would he have to explain both? Like I don't we, know if anybody if anybody would get get those on our team. <laughs> you know, it's like asking them, uh, you know, who Brad Marsh is, and they're, they they. Uh, I use this in my first year as a coach. I said you need to play more like Brad Marsh. You know, the big tough stay-at-home Flyers defenseman, and they all looked at me like I was a. Uh, uh, didn't know what I was talking about. I go, nobody knows who Brad Marsh is. And one guy raised his hand and said, yeah, he's the guy on NHL 94 that has the worst player rating. Uh, so uh, I think you gotta, you gotta take it for, for what it's worth as you get with these generations, you can't throw some of those references out and they just look at you sometimes. So I guess we're throwing out the uh, cream airplane references to tell your old man to drag Lanier yeah. and Russell up and down the court. And Lanier up, the, up and down the court, yeah. Well, Mike, I think we got a theme for the weekend. It's all about Rocky and airplane. I think we're set the rest of the way against LIU. Who's Mick in case that comes up again and you do actually have to cut a guy? Tim Goldinger. There you go. That's a, that's a, a lot of responsibility. 
Yeah, you gotta you gotta open up the eye. Is that something like he can do? Is he entrusted? Is he able to do that? No, no. All right. No, it. You know what? And, and Noah, Noah felt bad, and but it it is what it is. Injuries are part of the game. You know, we're playing without a, a couple of our top six forwards, and uh, you figure it out. Next man up, and we've been doing that with uh, with our with our skaters, and now we do it with our goaltending. And um, hopefully, we continue. We're close to every day. Every day we go on, we're closer and closer to getting healthy, and uh, we'll see how how that plays out throughout the week and more towards next week, actually, but we're getting there. Dirk, I don't know if you know anybody on the uh, committee. Uh, are, are we getting there in terms of at least knowing what the format's going to be for Atlantic Hockey postseason and NCAA tournament? Atlantic Hockey postseason, we had a co coach's call on Monday to discuss it. Um, that'll be with the ADs. The ADs have a conference call on Wednesday. Hopefully, we'll get some more clarity as far as that goes. Um, the local organizing committee for Pittsburgh and the Frozen Four continue to meet with uh, with the championships committee regarding the Frozen Four. Everything's on schedule as far as that goes. Um, the championships committee does have a meeting later in the week to start discussing um, the uh, format of picking teams and how those are going to uh, be affected. Uh, I've been been uh, told by coaches that they'd rather know sooner than later because it does affect how their playoffs go, does affect how um, they play down the stretch, especially if there's games that don't mean as much and, and things like that. So there are there is some urgency right now, but um, we are the NCAA tournament is looking at moving forward at the, the correct times. And and in Pittsburgh, I don't speak for the committee. I am on the committee, but I don't speak for it. But uh, uh, Everything that Robert Morris University has been told is that we're moving in the right direction. Any update on what might happen with that fourth region? Are they more likely to contract into two regions, I'm, or are they just I'm fine? Not, and don't know. Uh, that's that's done at higher levels than us, and I'm not. Uh, even if I was, I'm, I can't speak for the committee. That's not. My, I'm not the. I'm not the voice of the committee. That's the chair, Mike Kemp. So it. Uh, I'm just speaking as Robert Morris that we're on on pace to, to host the, the event at PPG Paints Arena in, in April. Well, you guys are ranked again this week back in the uh, USCHO top 20 at number 19. You've been 17. You've been 20. Uh, you starting to feel it a little bit, or is it still too early? Uh, are you thinking about uh, your current team and uh, whether or not it's uh, capable of winning Atlantic Hockey uh, Championship, whether or not it will have to do that to make the NCAA tournament, or are you just thinking – game at a time i think right now in this season and this during this pandemic it's one game at a time uh i think we got a little loose with with not our uh, how things we were but i think so we I'm got to look ahead by the way i'm, I'm matching i know you're always that way minnesota um, bc minnesota state that kind of thing yeah. I'm, I'm breaking I, it down i know you you are always are looking ahead um this is like back to the future in about 2015 when we've had all these discussions but um we are we have to take it game by game. You have to be appreciative of every game you get to play. Uh, I think we got a little bit loose because we were playing every weekend and then we got shut down a little bit uh, because of other teams. So you just got to, you can't look too far in advance because you don't know what's going to happen with other teams. You don't know what's going to happen every time you test. Um, you, you have to be positive that you're going to be negative and uh, you, you, you feel like you. Tim's had that so, down for years. Yeah, but it, the, the thing is, you've got you really have to, um, per se, be um, really able to make to change on the fly, be able to make adjustments, and you know it used to be some of the the, the more nervous parts of your day are: are you prepared for practice? Are you prepared for for playing on the weekend? Some of the ner most nervous parts of your day is: are you going to test negative? Um, when you get when we test so you wait for those results and you just keep chugging along and like I said you take it day by day our, our professionals at Mike Vitorino Tim Goldinger our whole athletic department staff I mean have done outstanding job to get us to, we played 17 hockey games and we're on pace to play 24 and um, if you would we would have talked about this in October you you sign up for this right now going in February 1st playing 17 games and you're you're 12 and 5 where, where do I sign? How quickly do I sign? And um, so you just have to be appreciative of it and uh, t 
take it day by day. You can't look at um, things that you look at. And the only good thing about this whole thing is I don't have to listen to you talk about where we are in the pairwise because the pairwise isn't going to yeah. be. Uh, uh, well, well, actually, that, that's a good point, Derek. I mean, that's that's, I mean, that's my big thing. It was that was a big thing for years. You're so and so in the pairwise. I don't have to hear you hear you talk about it like that. <laughs> Well, that's interesting to bring up, Derek, because I was going to go down that path too. And I'm asking you this as Derek Schooley, hockey coach and college hockey fan, not as, you know, committee member or anything like that. But I mean, there is some discussion about how do you get teams in because of the pairwise being a non factor this year with everybody playing such an imbalanced schedule. And one theorized notion that I've seen is I test. what's that? I test. Yeah. Well, I not only I you're test, in, you're out. Yeah, well, not only I test, but also like, you know, especially the smaller conference schools like you guys, maybe you make sure that there's at least two bids in for the Atlantic because it's a more representative sample because a lot of the bigger schools haven't played as much hockey. And it's harder to determine who the one bid out of the league might be, which is often the case with the conference champion. Is is that something that you agree with? Should the Atlantic be given two bids this year, especially with the way things have been split East and West? Yeah, that's something I can't talk about. I can't give you my opinion on that being on the committee. You know, I think everybody else, everybody's got an opinion out there. You listen to all the conference commissioners go on and everybody's going to be self-serving. You know, obviously the NCHC doesn't want, they want to go on historical data because they've had sometimes four teams on there. I mean, I think everybody's going to worry about themselves and everybody's going to discuss that. And that's for us as a committee to decide. So um, I can't give you my opinion, but that is a theory that's been thrown out there. The historical data has been thrown out there. Picking it off of uh, numerous different factors has been out there. And, and those are things that we'll discuss as we move forward. We're going to start meeting every week here. And uh, I would imagine those are things that we're going to have to discuss pretty quickly. You know what you ought to do is get about the 25 or so teams that you think are legitimately worthy get them all in a bubble and have one big shootout and then the 16 teams that win the shootout get to go what do you think yeah you're you and your crazy shootout ideas hey uh, derek i also wanted to ask you about uh liu the sharks getting going in a season that's a pandemic year uh, your former assistant, Mike Gershon, is doing the same thing with Chatham. You know what it's like to launch a program. How would you uh, imagine doing this under these circumstances this year? Well, you got to give uh, Brett Riley, you know, from the Riley hockey family, um, Brian and Rob and, uh, you know, Jack and, and all that, a lot of credit. He's a, a young a, a young coach and the youngest in college hockey. And uh, he started a Division three program, very successful and uh, he's put together a very good hockey team. And it's a lot of transfers, a lot of guys that uh, had played at other places. A lot of guys, uh, their leading scorer played at Huntsville. Um, they took some recruits from, from Huntsville when Huntsville was dropping their program. They've got transfers from all over. Garrett Metcalf's played their most minutes and uh, we've seen him at Mercier the last couple of years. So there's, there's a lot of uh, very good hockey players on there and uh, give them a lot of credit. They went out and they played eight games. Um, very tough to play in a pandemic year. They won their first one against Holy Cross. Uh, they beat RIT and they beat Army. I mean, this is not a, a first year program that it's gonna be a, a, a rollover. And when you're talking about things like the eye test and you're talking about things like that, these are, are games that, that you gotta do a good job in uh, because they are you know, they're three and five. This is a, this is a legitimate hockey team. And um, like I said, Mike Corbett coached a few of them at uh, Huntsville and their leading scorer is Christian Radjic, who I, I know I watched play junior hockey. He's a very good player. And um, so you, you got to give them credit. And Garrett Metcalf has beat us numerous times before when he was at Mercier. And you just, you sit here and you, um, you know, that you got to, you got to tell your team that you got to tell them that they, Hey, they beat our IT that we, we barely beat. They, beat Holy Cross. They beat Army. And Army is in second place, uh, in the top five right now in our league. So if you take them, if you sleep on them, they're going to beat you. So we can't sleep on this team. And um, we've got to go out and we've got to play our best. And um, hopefully the, our best is good enough. Derek, thanks. Appreciate it. We look forward to the games coming up this weekend. We'll be on the call on both the RMU 
app and will be on the call for Flow Hockey TV as well. Oh, one final question. Did you get your Nolan Arenado jersey yet? Have you gotten my that? Son, my son's already requested that uh, to put it next to his Goldschmidt jersey. <laughs> that's, that's quite a tandem. It'd be interesting to see what players are like that good in Pittsburgh again someday soon. I'm not going to hold my oh, breath. Yeah, they'll, they'll be coming through a couple, three times, right? <laughs> <laughs> you'll see him nine times here yeah probably just on tv but it, you'll see him <laughs> above the red on all right derek best of luck this weekend look forward to seeing the games thank you guys I look forward to having you appreciate everything you do and i said uh we miss uh being at uh, all-star sports grill on on uh what was it tuesday nights tuesday I think nights I, i think tim and i are going friday we're gonna work this out somehow yeah why not we can make that stop along the way we can make that happen yeah Sounds right. good, guys. Thank you.